Rose Palette and this is my breakdown session on Dowland's Lacrimae Pavan. and I'd like to share with you some of my thoughts I've accumulated over the years and aspects I'm still pondering on when it comes to performing this beautiful pavan. on the lute is which source do I want to use. The lacrime can be found in around 28 different collections in England and across Europe, which at first feels a little bit bamboozling, but these can be narrowed down to a handful of versions of which can be found in the main English manuscript collections of the period. These versions agree in structure as well as key, but still have variants within the divisions but are probably the most reliable in terms of Dowland's original intention. The Lacrimae was an extremely popular tune. Many of you tuning in will know the Lacrimae exists in various forms, not just as a lute solo. Dowland published the lute song version, Flow My Tears, in his second book of airs, 1600. This book came three years after his very successful publication of songs in 1597, which gave Dowland notoriety. He followed the song version with an arrangement of the pavan for var consort and lute in 1604 called Lacrime Antique, or Seven Tears Figured in Seven Passionate Pavans. This made Dowland into what we would call today a household name. The popularity and success of Dowland's Lacrime led to many misremembered mutations and incorrectly notated versions as folks tried to notate it down. Some composers honoured Dowland's composition by quoting it within their own works. Other versions have divisions wildly different from Dowland's own. Ultimately, the problem is that Dowland left no definitive version with his own stamp of authenticity. Here is a version from the Matthew Holmes Loop manuscript. Diana Poulton, in her incredible book on John Dowland, suggests that this version is the earliest known written source and goes on to say the exact date is bound up in the chronology of the Holmes collections, but goes on to say that by 1595 the Pavan would definitely have been in circulation. It's important to note the lacrime occurs twice in this collection. And this particular example is from the earlier book, D211. Here, at the beginning of the first division section after the main tune, is the most standard treatment of this first variant. to point out that the original version was probably for a six course lute, the diapason D being added at a later date and most likely by Matthew Holmes himself. I like to read from originals as much as possible. This version however I do find hard to read. The dim light of a concert hall or a church would certainly compound the problem. But it's still a great version and it's available in modern facsimile and gives useful indications as to the use of ornamentation. <laughs> Pickering loop 
Street book, dated 1616, is a lovely clear edition for the six course instrument, the ending being particularly florid. the low diapasons in this version. <laughs> the version found in the Luke book of Edward Lord Herbert of Sherbury dated around 1616 to 1640 is also a really nice performance edition but gives little away in terms of ornamentation. I would recommend this version but for this session though I want to focus on the setting found in the Folger Dowland Luke book named after its resting place the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington. I love this version and I love this book. I have to say, it's a setting of the lacrime that's not the most reliable. Thankfully, not as dubious as William Barley's printed version in his publication in 1596 called A New Book of Tablature. Dowland refers to Barley's version in the preface of his first book of songs as being printed without his knowledge, false and unperfect. The dating of the Folger Dowland Loop book is around 1610, quite a bit of time after the Matthew Holmes version. The ownership and the hand of the Folger manuscript is unknown. Dowland signed the manuscript five times in various places, but the lacrime wasn't one of these pieces that was fortunate to be authenticated in this way. At least we know Dowland handled this book at some point. In fact, it's one of the few collections that has one of his compositions in its entirety, written in Dowland's own hand, My Lady Hunson's Almain. <laughs> of the lacrime from the Folger Library is the one I like the most. The script is ghostly, delicate and light, contributing to the book's mantle of mystery. We know that Dowland was around the book while it was being compiled, but we don't know for certain in what capacity. The manuscript is progressive and so it's most likely Dowland was present as his tutor. The crossings out and the indication of ornamentation all contribute to the personal thought that went into committing these pieces to paper and in turn provide clues to performance. <laughs> from the Folger Dowland loop book.
Similarly, we can hear complex interweaving lines. This is where, as a loop player, your choice of fingerings becomes critical. But I would like to stress, fingering, I feel, is a personal decision-making process. Folks have different shaped hands and effective results can be gained from different methods. I don't like to dictate fingering, but this aspect of playing the lute is always forefront in my mind as I build up layers when it comes to preparing a piece for performance. So here are my thoughts on the opening phrase. The music is immediately working on different levels. First you have the main tune. The tune has to be served on a plate to your audience. In a way, this is the most critical part of the whole piece. That famous four note motif must be instantly recognisable. As soon as your audience know what the tune is, they can then sit back and bask in the divisions. So the next thing to consider is the inner part, which interweaves itself around the tune. Here it is in isolation. the two lines combined. This means thinking of the tune and the inner part as linear lines. The tune obviously more present than the second line. Considering the parts separately in this manner helps you to distinguish the more important notes from the notes that should not interfere so much. Just to say, if you want to investigate the idea of strong and weak notes a little bit further, Nigel North has written an excellent article in Lute News, number 128, on the importance of good and bad notes called The Articulate Lutinist. I highly recommend it. So linear lines can be difficult to spot when a piece has been entabulated. Using your ears and seeking out these lines and following their musical paths ultimately leads to understanding the composer's rhetorical intention. So far, we have just put the two top lines together. Here comes a difficult bit. You have to sustain the bass. Here it is in isolation. It's the bass that underpins the harmonic scheme. So the difficult bit is to sustain the bass in combination with the hierarchical order of the tune in the inner part. To do this, I feel a little bit of nifty finger work is necessary. These bars are okay. For me, it's all pinned round the G on the fourth course. It's very satisfying to play. The tricky bit is to create a convincing shift into the next section in bar 3. I've come to the conclusion that barring the E flat major chord is the way forward. The E flat underpins the whole bar, everything else works around it. Finally, using the open G, the last note of the bar on the first course, to help you lever yourself into chord 5 of the imperfect cadence, D major.
So now I'd like to investigate aspects of rhetorical intention and pathos within these first four bars. This is obviously a very personal view and putting into words a musical phrase to attempt to explain what that phrase is communicating is a deeply subjective thing to do. One thing I would like to say is that these views can shift. You can play a phrase many different ways and for me sometimes I find my views change depending on how I'm feeling that day. I'd like to fall back on Marsilio Ficino at this point, a leading figure of Platonic thought in Florence, 1433 to 99, to help explain how music is interwoven with the human spirit. The soul and body are in harmony with each other by natural proportion, as are the parts of the soul and the parts of the body. Indeed, the harmonious cycles of fevers and humours and the movements of the pulse itself also seems to imitate this harmony. In this letter, Ficino goes on to say, The first music takes place in reason, the second in fantasy, and the third in words. Thence follows song and after that movement of the fingers in sound. So now follows my personal thoughts on the opening of the lacrime. You have the G minor chord dropping to the middle octave, followed by a two note chord, the minor sixth, then a semitone of the last two notes with a descending scale which forms the main tune. I imagine the scene of a solitary soul looking down into the darkness. Immediately we are struck by the melancholy tone. This semitone emphasises the pathos straight away. Centred around the G, mentioned earlier, you have an almost bell-like repetition of the bass note, followed by a leap of a minor sixth. There's that minor sixth again, as if the downward turned eyes suddenly look to the heavens. I also might fill in the G minor chord for a fuller sound at the very beginning. Then you have this G minor sound world moving to the E flat major in the third bar. It feels a little abrupt, certainly unexpected. It's as if the eyes lift up to the heavens, to the light. And the key of E flat is a duller sound on the lute. It's deliberately not too bright so it's in keeping with the mood. Then the tune comes to rest on chord five. Its relationship with the tonic key concludes the first phrase.
like to move on and talk a little bit about ornamentation. In the Folger book, there are indications of ornamentation in the form of a sharp sign. Ornaments can, without a shadow of a doubt, contribute towards expressing rhetorical intention in a piece. They can lift a dance into something airy and light, or express deep sorrow when delaying a consonant note. But for me personally, I always treat indications of ornamentation with caution. The words of Jean-Baptiste Bessardo always springs to mind when I'm considering such matters. You should have some rules for the sweet relishes and shakes if they could be expressed here, as they are on the lute. But seeing they cannot by speech or writing be expressed, thou wert best to imitate some cunning player, or get them by thine own practice. Only take heed, lest in making too many shakes thou hinder the perfection of the notes. So, at the very start of the Folger edition of the Lacrimae, I would take heed. Four ornaments notated in as many bars. To be played? How? We don't know. The same marking is used for each ornament. Are they all to be played the same? We don't know. Are they trills, mordants, appoggiatoras? We don't know for sure. If they are some sort of shake or trill, would the auxiliaries be on the upper or lower notes? We still don't know. Should we invent what we see fit? Probably, yes. Remember Bessado's words, seeing they cannot by speech or writing be expressed. For me, to play all the indicated ornamentation here would hinder the perfection of the notes. destroys the heavenly line. There are plenty of opportunities to ornament later in the piece. For me, no trills, ornamentation or deviation from what is written is required here. And embedding them risks losing the rhetorical intention Dowland set out to communicate. If I were to add an ornament at this point, it would probably be in the descending motif at the very beginning. So I can hear you asking me, why were they written? Taste, style, ethos, all of these things come to us differently as individuals. Maybe Dowland didn't like it either. Maybe he scowled at his student for writing them. Maybe that's why he didn't sign his name to this version. If you have any thoughts, I'd welcome them. breakdown has only covered four bars. Much pondering is required for such a sophisticated piece and our time is short for this video. Pieces like this and many other stunning works become old friends. You get to know them over a long period of time. Layer by layer a picture slowly builds up over the years. I'm still pondering on this piece and will continue to do so, delving further into the relationship between each note. At the end of the day though, the aim is to communicate, be it through the spoken word, an exquisite brush stroke, or the vibration of a string.
All the editions I have mentioned in this video are available from the Lute Society catalogue of publications. If you would like to hear a full version of My Lacrimae Pavan, look for the collection of songs and solos by Amarilli on the Lute Society YouTube channel. The link is found below this video in the description box. If you'd like to find out a bit more about me, check out my YouTube channel at LuteWeb or visit my website at LuteWeb.com.